Welcome back to Too Cool for Middle School. Today we're going to be talking about literature circles or book clubs, specifically using historical fiction books. I have another couple of videos and some materials about how to do book clubs or literature circles with fantasy books, but I think the genre really matters. I don't think that you can really just take like any generic literature circle or book club material and apply it to any book. I think if you are genre specific and really teach kids how to read that genre and what to look for, then things will go a lot better. Historical fiction is probably my favorite genre and it's what I read most of when I was in middle school and then even today. I love the process of learning more about a particular time in history, a particular place, an event, and seeing it through the eyes of characters that I can like relate to and that I feel something for and I feel invested in. And I think that that's a really good way to kind of hook students into reading and hook them into history. So you can definitely use these in an English class, of course, and then maybe if you had sufficient time in your social studies classes or history classes, you could also use something like this to teach a particular unit. We're going to talk about a couple of different things today. We will talk briefly about how to choose the books, even more briefly about how to get the books. We'll talk about the elements of historical fiction that you would be teaching to your students through this process. We'll talk about the timing. How long is this going to take? Um, we'll talk about how to divide up um, jobs or responsibilities between students and then how much you have them do together because the point of this right is to discuss these books and like read them together but then also how to hold them individually accountable and give them individual assignments as well so that there is that balance and they do feel the individual pressure just a little bit and they can't completely just ride the coattails of their group so we're going to talk about all of that i will link all of the materials down below so you can get those and follow along or if you just got those materials and you need um, someone to just help you walk through it a little bit that's what this video is for okay so first of all what books should you choose for historical fiction literature circles the ones that I chose this year that I've been building up for a couple of years in my library are all about working conditions around the turn of the 20th century it's a decent theme I I don't completely love it, I'll tell you why, but you're gonna need to have some kind of unifying theme. And so I, I think that theme could be really anything from like a common struggle like ours was, so it's, you know, people and mostly girls facing working conditions that were really dangerous and unfair. A lot of them, a lot of the, the books that we read like end with the Triangle Factory fire so that's an interesting theme. Um, maybe they're all set during World War II, but you choose books from all different places. Maybe you choose some set in the United States, some in Western Europe, in Eastern Europe, in Japan, maybe in like Korea. I think that would be a really interesting way to get a bunch of different perspectives on one global event. So those would all have a common time and event, but different places. Or you could go the other way around. You could have historical fiction books that are set in the same place across different time periods. So like I'm in California, we could do historical fiction novels all set in California, like some set during the gold rush, maybe from like two different perspectives, some set during the Zoot Zoot riots. We could go as far forward as like Front Desk by Kelly Yang, which is in like the 90s, you know, and just kind of like look at like a, a cross section of time from this one place. You could choose books by the same author if you wanted. Like I have a whole video about Ruta Sepetys because I really like her historical fiction work and a lot of her books are set during World War II, not all of them, but they are all sort of like lesser known stories from like countries whose history we know a little bit less about. Romania and Lithuania and countries like that. So you could do a Ruta Sepetys book club. One of my favorite uh, like book club situations that I taught maybe like like six years ago and I just kind of did this by accident but it turned out so good was we 
As an eighth grade class, we read The Diary of Anne Frank, which was in our textbook. And then my students were just very interested in World War II and reading more about it. So then I just had all of them pick any book that was set during World War II from any perspective at all. So it wasn't really like a book club so much because every student picked a different one but we all we were just kind of like all in one big book club and we sat in a circle and we discussed you know the different things happening in all of our books and that turned out so so good so that's another tip I think if you can read one common text that's a little bit shorter maybe it's a short story maybe it's a play um, our diary of Anne Frank text was the play version. So if you can read something like that, that you have a touch point for where everybody has read this one common text and then you allow them to branch out from there, then I think it makes it much easier because throughout this unit, you're going to be teaching them specific um, like elements of historical fiction. And so if they can, if you can use that first example as your example to go off of for all of those elements and then have them apply that to whatever book that they now have, um, then that can work really well. The reason that I didn't love the set of books that I chose that I've been gathering for like five or six years applying for grants for, uh, this was like a preset book list from like New York and it's okay. But the thing is like, several of the books were really, really, really similar. Like they're very good books. I'll put a picture of them right here. What were they again? <laughs> so we did Audacity, and that's a novel in verse, so that's a really good way to just bring in um, another kind of like subgenre. So this is a historical fiction novel in verse. Maybe like have that as an option for some kids. So that one, Ashes of Roses and Uprising, um, but at least those three are like very, very similar and they all kind of um, revolve around or like lead up to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. So in my mind, I was always getting them a little bit confused and then you'll have kids do like reports every week, maybe like twice a week, they'll kind of like share out with the group what they're reading about. And it's a little bit hard to keep those ones straight. And then we did Counting on Grace, Bread and Roses 2 and Liddy. Bread and Roses 2, I love. I feel like it focuses more on um, unionizing and strikes and stuff like that, which was also great, but maybe then that could have been our theme. So we just had books that were kind of like all in the same time period, but then a little bit different, <laughs> and books that were all mostly set in New York, but then a few that weren't. And so that was just like a little bit hard. Like I think I would next time, and if I can get more money, possibly like spread out the settings maybe, because this is, you know, uh, a lot of them are, are set during like 1910, 1911, right around the Shirtwaist Factory Fire. Um, and so like what was happening in the South at that time? There's a lot of like sharecropping and things like that going on. And so, or like, I don't know, if we're just going to focus on factory work, like maybe extend that to other situations. I don't know. So again, my choices were fine, but I feel like you could get maybe even a little bit more creative and maybe choose books that are a little bit more distinct so that when you are having those um, class discussions, it's easier to keep track of which book is which. So that's just my advice on that. As far as like getting the books, um, I amassed them over several years and just like applied for grants that were usually around like $200, $300. And so that would buy me like 20 or 30 books. And so that was like almost a class set, not quite. <laughs> this time I had three class periods of students. So I needed about like 100 books. So I did get another grant. Um, and then what I did too was like I had, you know, a certain number of each title for each class period. And so I had a day where students got to choose which book they wanted. And if we ran out of the book that they wanted, they were free to go, you know, like get that book from the library, the community library, the school library, they could purchase it. So if they really, really wanted a certain book, they could just go get it on their own. But I would just provide like level one access and your first choice of books might not be available, but whatever. The next thing you'll want to do is like a book tasting activity of some kind. And if I create one between now and when I 
upload this video, I will link it below, but on Teachers Pay Teachers, there's like a million different examples of book tasting activities. You can find them explained on like teacher blogs and stuff, but you just have copies of the books out and you have kids, you know, read a couple of pages, kind of jot down their thoughts about them and expose them to each one of the books so that they can make an informed decision about which one they want to read. And then in my classes, um, whoever chose the same book as their number one choice, they all ended up in the same group. So I have classes of like 35-ish. And so we had about eight different groups and I think we had six different books. So sometimes, um, you know, one class, everybody would want to read Uprising or whatever. And it was too many people for just one group, like it would have gotten too hectic. So then I split them into two and we had about eight groups per class. That part is a lot of stress to set up. But then once you're at that point, I think I've got you. I think I can help make it a little bit easier throughout the rest of the experience. Okay, so I found that if you allow for four weeks, you can get this done. I believe we went slightly over our four weeks because we had a few days off and things like that, but approximately four weeks. Now, the first thing that I had students do when they got into their groups besides like a little get to know you thing, was set up a reading plan. So you're gonna have all these different groups of kids reading these different books that are different lengths. But I wanted everyone to have their book read in three weeks. So we said this whole thing's gonna be four weeks, but let's read the book in three weeks so that our final week of discussion everyone has read the book. We're not still in that process of trying to read. So um, I have a little slide where they type in their page numbers that they wanna get done. So I just have them do like beginning, middle, end. So week one, you're gonna read the beginning, then you're gonna read the middle, and then you're gonna read the end. And so divide up your book either by like page number or by chapter, or if they're, maybe it does have like three sections and you just wanna use those sections. So the kids just, it takes like almost a full period. I feel like it was kind of a long time <laughs> that we spent doing this, but they just, as a group, divided it all up and figured out how much they were gonna read in that first week and then divided that up by like five. So if you're reading five days a week, how many pages do you need to read each day? And then week two, you're reading the middle and week three, you're gonna get to the end. So your final box there is gonna have the final page. And then this is just like a little reading tracker for them. So what I have them do is like, it's a certain color. And then whenever they read the amount of pages that was in one of the box, I just had them turn it to a different color. Just like fill in, use that little color fill tool and change it to the next color. So you can just see how far you've come and how much there is left to do. This was something I had them turn in, but I didn't really look all that closely at it. Like this is a unit where they are gonna be taking a lot of personal responsibility and I'm not gonna be able to check on you every single day and see if you did your reading. There's there's not really even a way for me to do that. So this is, this is your tool and you should be using it and if you turn it into me and lie and say you read it and you didn't, that's fine. <laughs> I'm probably gonna give you like the five points that I made this assignment work worth, but um, you're not gonna be able to do any of the other assignments. <laughs> so that's not gonna work out for you grade-wise in the end. So um, we're not magic, so we're not gonna be able, we're not, we're not psychic, we're not gonna be able to tell um, whether or not they read and like give them, you know, daily points for reading the night before. But when you read their essays and when you look at their assignments you'll be able to tell whether or not they read it'll be glaringly obvious the other thing was i did give them time in class to read some they were still going to need to read a little bit outside of class i have about 42 minute class periods every day i, I see my students every day for f like either 42 or 45 minutes i think those are our two different schedules um so i think when we like first got our books. I gave them quite a while to get started with reading 
and then as we moved into this unit I would give them like the first five or ten minutes to read before they had their discussions so they could kind of like get back into the mindset of their book and stuff so depending on how much class time you have available you could give them more time to read but they will probably at some point have to take on a little bit of independent reading on their own and I think that's reasonable. So the next thing that they're going to do is figure out their group roles. Now these are editable for you as the teacher because there might be different things that you like for students to do. I gave you six just to get started and you might not have six people in each group but then somebody can do more than one. There are some that are like you know you can handle two to roles if, if you have one of them. Um, so discussion leader keeps your conversation on topic, make sure that everyone is contributing to the conversation. Slides editor, I'll explain that in a minute, like the way that I pushed out the slides and it will, this will just be based on personal preference, how you wanna give them the slides, but I only gave access to certain people to edit the slides and I kept an entire class period on one slide deck and it had like eight different slides on it for the eight different groups and then I just gave one or two people in each group editing access and they had to just stay on their one slide but if I gave it to everyone like in the whole class it got too messy so it took a little bit of time to share out individually but that's just how we did it and the reason that I like that is because then um, like at the bottom of your slides you can click on the little thing that looks like a waffle and then you can see all the slides at one time so you can see all at once like whether or not every group is actually getting work done during their work time and you can also see what they're writing so sometimes they start writing and they're like way way off so then you can be like okay group three is not on it so then you can just go over to group three and be like okay guys what you actually are supposed to be doing right now is this and then you can kind of redirect them so I don't like to give them the slides and then have them make a copy because now they're working on it but I can no longer see it like that's easier initially but then I can't see it. I, I want to see the progress as it's going and I want to make sure to to keep you on track so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second but that's why I have slide editors um, and then tech and design this is just this person also had editing access um, to make sure that the slides were like presentation ready and they didn't have any grammar errors or things like that even though they still did but you know somebody to look over the thing before you uh, share it and to also make sure that it's like easy on the eye like as we are teaching them to do presentations and stuff it's good to just like teach kids about you know font styles and like not having like really clashing colors if you can help it and like bright red font on like a yellow background or something like you want this to be pleasing to the eye as you present so that's that person text specialist is the person who absolutely has their book out I mean everybody needs to have their book out but if you're looking for like a page number or the example or quote or whatever they are flipping through the book to find it and then a fact checker and so whoever needs to like google something or look up something there's actually a lot of this that happens with a historical fiction book club so you need somebody to do that and then the presenter and I had everybody take turns being the presenter and so we had seven different presentations I think and some groups of like four and some groups of six and so you know occasionally somebody would present more than others but um on that section of the slide they wrote in like what's the order gonna be uh, like who would present first and then second and then third um, and then like if somebody was absent on the day they were supposed to present then you would just go to the next person um, and really like anyone should be prepared to present at any time because you're having the discussions together anyway so um, yeah just trying to like take out some of those like decision making things at the beginning so that once we're rolling in our book clubs you don't have to like think about all those things okay so this is all week one still we're not really gonna start the book clubs until week two so week one is all like prep work so they do have a reading 
schedule, right? So they should be reading at this time. Maybe you can give them a little bit of time in class, like after they figure out their group roles, maybe they read for the rest of class. Um, the next thing that you're gonna do during this week of prep is talk about the elements of historical fiction. And so I teach them about seven different elements of historical fiction. We're gonna go over those at the beginning to make sure that they know what those are. And then throughout the next three weeks, we're gonna look specifically at those different things in their books. So it's good if before this week one has started, you guys read something together as a class that you can refer back to. Okay, so on my slides, the, the seven things that I have are character identity, dialogue, setting, world building, conflict, plot, and theme. And then there's also a, like a worksheet that goes along with this. So taking notes on this worksheet and like going through these different elements took like two teaching days. Maybe that's because we were doing, um, you know, some other kind of like housekeeping things, organizational things, getting kids their books and giving them a little bit of reading time and stuff like that. But it took like two or three days. Oh, and also I was showing little videos. So this did, that's why I'm thinking like this took almost that whole week one, but it's just, it's just a lot of prep, yeah. So, character identity. In a historical fiction novel, the character's unique identity is gonna have a really specific impact on the plot. So like, what I wrote about here is that if you have a book that's set in the United States and there's a female character and this is set before like 1920, they don't have the right to vote. So that might impact the types of decisions that they make or the type of power that they actually have. Um, you know, they may like want a certain thing, but it's not even a possibility for someone with their identity in their world. So they might have to kind of, you know, <laughs> just like operate in a different way because of their identity. So um, I have them consider things like, what is the character's gender? How old are they? Like a lot of times you've got a historical fiction novel about like a fairly young kid and like, oh my gosh, and something happened to their parents and now they're on their own. So they're this young kid trying to figure out how to survive. So how does that play in? What is their race? A book set in the United States this is gonna matter quite a bit during almost every single period of time. What languages do they speak? We had a couple characters in the books that, that we were reading that like didn't speak English when they first came to the United States. So this limits what kind of jobs that they can have. Um, it kind of prevents them from like standing up for themselves or like knowing what the laws around working conditions and stuff are. So that's a very real thing. Um, are they an immigrant? What's their socioeconomic status? What family responsibilities do they have? A lot of times in YA historical fiction novels, um, someone is responsible for like their little brother or sister or for their mom or something like that. So, you know, that might play into how the, the story is going to play out. Later on, we're gonna come back to this and we're gonna be talking about it in your specific book clubs and they're gonna be presenting this information as well. And then later on after that, I also asked them to write an, a very short essay on this topic as well. Once they had read the beginning of their book, they should have a pretty good sense of their character's identity and be able to write one paragraph about this. Okay, as an example, I showed them a video of people pronouncing Irish names. I don't know if you've ever seen people do that, but it, it's hard to do. The spellings are tricky. Um, and a lot of the characters in their books were Irish immigrants. And we had read a text in our textbook, sorry, I forgot to mention, but it was just an excerpt from one of the books that we were reading. So it got a little bit confusing, but some of the characters in that excerpt were Irish immigrants. So we, you know, just kind of got a better sense. My students didn't know a whole lot about like Ireland or <laughs> like Irish names or, or anything like that. We don't have a lot of like Irish identity around here. So um, yeah, that was just something to kind of like show them like, okay, this could be a big part of this person's identity. Okay, the next thing that we talked about was dialogue. Um, I wanted to have pretty like, specific detail type of questions in these discussions because I wanted kids to look closely at those details and not just be reading through really, really fast and like not paying attention um, because then it's very hard to like have any deep discussions about these books. Okay, so the dialogue one is pretty easy. Um, I just had them find like words or phrases that were used at that time that we might not use today. So for my example in ours, I use the word shirtwaist. That's not really something that we 
wear today or say today or talk about today. Um, and then I have a little picture of a, a shirtwaist because a lot of the characters in the books that we were reading worked in a shirtwaist factory. So um, that's just something that they have to find specifically in their book, either like a term or a word or a way of speaking that people maybe wouldn't use today. So you'll also notice that we have like a pretty meaty topic followed by like that's something that's like a little bit easier to do. So week two we did the character identity for their book at the beginning of the week and like yeah that that's going to take quite a bit of discussion they're really going to need to know their stuff and then um they presented on that the next day like the tuesday and then wednesday they're doing dialogue you know dialogue's not quite as difficult to talk about and pull out and come up with it's a little bit like lighter <laughs> a lighter mental load and they presented on that thursday i think um and then we worked on the essay about character identity friday i'll give you like a, a breakdown of like lesson plan suggestions like how to fit this in within a week but you will notice that there's like kind of some pretty meaty stuff and then like just little details that will still show me whether or not they're reading but like maybe not you know going 100 <laughs> percent every single day that could be kind of hard we go through these slides week one sorry if this is confusing week two we went more deeply into character identity and dialogue. And then week three, this is when we get into setting and world building. Okay. <laughs> and by week three, they should have read the beginning and the middle and be working on reading the, the last part of the book. So <laughs> I'll have this all typed up for you, but yeah, we're moving right along and it's important to keep up with the reading as, as they're going. So. Rewinding it back to week one where, where we're just talking about the elements. So setting is the next element that we talk about. In a historical fiction book, setting is just like so, 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 so important. Time and place. So sometimes we don't think of place, but it's time as well. Generally, whoever writes a YA nonfiction book is going to choose a specific time and place where something big is happening. Perhaps there's a war going on or a revolution or just something that's difficult to survive, something that's leading up to like a pretty major historical event. Like that's, you know, usually the plot of the book. So they need to be really, really in tune with the time and place. And so we're going to give them time to research this, research what is happening, who's in power, um, you know, what is life like in this place during this time? Um, is it a rural area? Is it a city? Who's the leader of the country? What kind of government are the characters living under? That might be irrelevant in some stories. It might be really relevant in other stories. Um, are, is the character, like are your main characters safe? in this place or no? What is the weather like? Maybe that won't impact them at all, but like, are they in danger of freezing to death or, or anything like that? So sometimes your students will like try to answer every single one of these questions and they're like not really thinking about their own book specifically. And so like if a question doesn't apply to your book, ignore it. Like think about what things are specific to your book. Um, what kind of building do your characters live in or work in? Is, is that gonna be something that applies to yours. And so I had them watch this cool video about New York apartments. I just like this video a lot, but since many of our books were set in New York, that's one that we used for an example. So when they're making their own slides, um, they are going to be looking up a lot of this information. They can put pictures on their slides that they'll present to the class and really dig into that like time and place. Now we move over to the like slightly more fluffy side of this, but this is what makes a historical fiction novel fun. The world building. It's kind of like the setting, but it's like the much smaller details. The thing that makes you feel like you are living in this book. It makes this book come to life. Um, you feel like, you know, you understand this world. So it could be like, what kind of clothes are people wearing? What items do they use every day? Are they driving in cars or are they riding horses? Are they wearing like petticoats? Like, you know, what types of things do they have to use? Do they have to use like feather quill pens and stuff like that? Like, you know, what's going on in this book? What kind of foods do they eat? How much money did things cost back then? Oh, again, like how do they travel? Is it, are they walking? Is it by horse? Is it by train? Is it by car? You know, when is this set? 
Um, and then, you know, just like maybe even what do they do when they first wake up or go to bed? How do they speak to each other? So ask them these details about their book. Again, if you haven't read or haven't read closely, you're really just not gonna be able to answer these questions. But these are the things that are fun to talk about in a literature circle and that like make the book fun for you as well. Um, I used um, <laughs> like a video about Titanic fashion of somebody like analyzing the movie, like the fashion in the movie as a historian and like, you know, explaining whether or not it was accurate and it is. Um, but yeah, like clothing in the 19, teens, 1910s, was very different from how it is today. So that's part of the world building aspect of a historical fiction novel. Okay, for conflict, now, obviously we're talking about this in week one, but maybe we are end of week three or getting into week four when we're talking about the conflict. And I've placed these in a specific order because even if they've only read a little bit, they would still be able to do like setting, character identity, get a sense of the world building but like conflict we're putting that at the end because they're probably not really going to know the full extent of the conflict until they've read most of the book so we're saving that one for later um but they're probably going to have two conflicts in a historical fiction novel so there is some historic conflict that's going on that everybody in the book is impacted by in one way or another it's a war it's the abolition of slavery, it's the um, refugee crisis, it's what, you know, there's, there's something that's going on that's impacting everyone. And then the main character in your book is also going to be going through a personal crisis. So when they go off to fight the war, do they also like leave behind their fiance or something? Or as they are like determining whether or not they should like run away from this plantation, are they leaving behind family members or like deciding if they should bring them with them or something like that. So with a historical fiction novel, you're always gonna have those two different conflicts. And so this will be a place that you're gonna wanna like give them some time to talk about this. So then as we reach the end of their books and we're kind of coming to the end of the study, now's a good time to do plot. Um, we can trace out, okay, <laughs> what has happened here. So with a historical fiction novel, it's kind of interesting to look at um, what events were real, what parts of the plot actually happened, and then what did the author, you know, dream up in their imagination and write in for these characters. So you'll do plot a little bit differently. You'll kind of have like two plots going on, um, the historical events, and then what's happening to the character. So again, like, with different genres, you, you do have to like look at them differently. So I, that's why I think this was kind of fun to, to just like pull this apart differently than we would our fantasy literature circles, for example. My battery is dying. I am running out of time. Theme was our final discussion that we had. Like, was there an overall theme in this book? Like, did the characters learn to like stand up for themselves even when it was hard or hold on tra to traditions even in the face of change or something like that? So you're gonna be looking at theme in the very end. And how does that theme relate specifically to your story? And can you apply any of those lessons to today? That's always the mark of a really good historical fiction novel where you can like see yourself in that situation and you're inspired to like, you know, be brave in a situation just like that character was or whatever. Before my battery dies, one other note is like use the author's notes or the background information or whatever they call it at the very end. Those will be incredibly important for helping students understand the book. So the authors tend to give lots of more background information, explain how they did their research, explain where the ideas came from or like the inspiration for the book came from. So spend a whole day, and, and I have that like in these slides, but spend a whole day looking at that part of the book. We tend to skip over that like, oh, we made it to the end. Okay, skip that. Sometimes there's pictures at the end or, you know, just like other citations that are really, really helpful for students. And finally, you are able to edit like the three different essays that you have students write. So in whatever way that you like for them to write them, I had them write three two chunk paragraphs and that's like the Jane Schaefer method. You can like Google that. I can give you examples of it. I think I have examples in there. Um, but just like however you want them to write is fine. But I just had them write one individual essay at the end of each of those three weeks and then it was like glaringly obvious who was reading and who was understanding and who wasn't. It's really hard to 
do the writing if you haven't done the reading. And so that got like equal grading weight as the work that they did in the groups. So if they needed a lot of help from their groups, cool, that's fine. You know, you're going to get some points for that, but you also have some that is resting upon you yourself individually. This is that struggle in middle school. It's sometimes hard to get people to <laughs> take responsibility for their own learning. So you want to have a nice, nice little mix of both. And that's, that is what I like about this unit is that it is that nice little mix of group discussions that really help um, enrich their understanding. And then also showing me individually, you know, what you've noticed and what you've learned and how you can express that in writing. Cause we also want you to be able to do that too. So I'm going to link all of this below for you. I love this unit. I'm so excited about it. Feel free to leave any questions in the comments below and I am excited to see you use this in your classrooms. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye.